Welcome to the Cinematologist podcast. I'm Dario Linares, and with me down the line, of course, it's great to see and hear Neil Fox. How are you doing, Neil? I'm good. Hello. It's yeah, it's lovely to be back. I'm I'm, I'm doing really well actually. It's the last full day for me. Um, just come out of a full day external validation event for uh, an MSC, which was fine actually. Yeah, it was really well run. So. And that wasn't a lot of work at all. It was really well managed. So that was actually a really, really decent experience. For those in academia, that an external validation is when you basically sit around and interrogate a, a new course and kind of give it the, the third degree about the, the content organization and, and what have you. And sometimes they can be really pleasant and nice and other times they can be pretty harsh depending on how much research and background and development has been done leading up to it. Yeah, and they've done a lot of the work really. It was a really straightforward thing we had a nice conversation about some of the aspects of it particularly around sustainability so yeah i'm feeling it's weird to feel good after a validation but i do so i'm excited to be here i was thinking it's been a while since we've done this um for an episode although we've both been spending time with each other doing versions of this because i did a talk for you and your students that you we then put out and then last night you did a talk for a research seminar which i was at so doesn't feel like it's been an age since we've heard each other talk but it's no. not in this context no we just can't escape each other that's the that's the thing you know when you've been working together with somebody you know what is it now eight years eight and a half years probably um in terms of the podcast nearly nine years it'll be nine years in february for the podcast yeah yeah but then probably another year year and a bit on top of that in terms of just being in the same institution but yeah it's funny how everything kind of becomes intertwined doesn't it and and um there's kind of, I, I mean, I know, I don't think I'm speaking out of time, we're saying that there's good and there's good and bad in that at, at times, you know what I mean? Sometimes it's it, it's like, Jesus, I just want to get on with this thing. I know, I know, you know, it's it, there's no sort of animosity about that, but it's just kind of funny, isn't it, that, that when you work together for a long time, it's always, there's always that sort of specter of the other collaborator somewhere in the, uh, in the ether. Well, that speaks to a lot of your uh, often, you know, under underplaying or offhanding in terms of your own research and practice, you know, because I, I know like last night hearing you talk about your, your podcast studies research, you know, it's just, it's always really invigorating. And I think one of the, one of the things that's been really interesting having worked with you for so long now is, has being able to not only see that research take shape, but to, which again goes to what you were talking about in that talk about longevity and voice, but how you talked about it, how you've understood it, how your thinking has developed. You know, to the point where last night you're just you're just kind of effortlessly kind of engaging with some really complex ideas in a really invigorating way, and it's 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 a nice moment for me as a friend and colleague to be like, oh yeah, this is this is the result of a long period of work, and you can feel the work in it. So while there might be a spectre, it might be I think a bit more like Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not the devil on your shoulder going. Yeah, shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, it was it was interesting actually, sort of doing that talk yesterday because, as I said at the beginning beginning of it, everybody's running on fumes, and they, you know they weren't. It wasn't wasn't that well attended, which I kind of expected because it's people are just at the end of the tether when it comes to work in academia. But as I was sort of doing it, I thought, oh no, th- th- this this is working. But I still felt like I needed kind of more time to think through some of the ideas that I was trying to draw out because. It's funny because like like I was saying in the talk, I sat down and put together what I wanted to say in terms of clips and then sort of thought through, yeah, I want to say this and I want to say that in terms of the sort of academic research type outcomes that have come out of doing podcasting, but then sort of tying it together in a way that, that thinks through like an idea about a new methodology or a new concept, then, you know, you've just... The, the lack of time to be able to sort of really scrutinize that for yourself before you put it out in front of somebody or in front of a you know group of academics it's just it's just not there and it's just yeah I was thinking about it after I delivered it it's like that was done on sort of five percent of my time and the rest of my time is spent doing admin and you know teaching and management and that little five percent is the academic work that you really want to be doing you know what I mean and it's just it's amazing how much you know, academics get a lot of shit, you know, and, and what I mean by that is the the internal sort of amount of work that they have to do is always more and more and more. I mean, you know, I could go on about the, the, the workload has shifted from administration to onto academics, but also the kudos of the job is not what it used to be. 
and that was the the reason why people went into academia but you know apart from sort of researching and contributing to knowledge and all that and but the low pay was offset by other things there was a sort of freedom being able to do what what kind of what you wanted to do but yeah more and more that that that's sort of disappearing and i think that a lot of academics that you know who who are really often i think maligned you know when they're at the top of the, those that are the, that are sort of at the top of their game are doing an awful lot of like i say management and keeping the ship afloat work but yeah their their research still seems to get done in, in the liminal spaces of of all their other times to to coin a, a word yeah i like it sometimes to like dragging yourself up for a sunrise you know where you're like oh, i just want to stay in bed like i really need to sleep but then you get there and you're like the sunrise is great you know and i think that was the thing is like there might not have been many people there but it was certainly even online you could sense that it's one of it was one of those times where you're like i'm glad i came because there is all that other stuff to compete with always but and you know there are increasingly few spaces where the job feels like the job as imagined you know where you're in a space with people thinking through ideas talking through ideas that are of relevance in a number of different ways and i always feel grateful in those moments even even if it took me and it didn't not yesterday but certainly a lot of this a lot of this stuff is if it took a kind of an effort to get there to be like no i will go because you could easily just not go because everything is really stressful so i completely understand that um but i thought it was a good good discussion and a good a good group of people and i wanted to say can you share your slides because there's lots of stuff on there i was making notes i was like oh i'd like to I'd like yeah to. yeah sure sure i'll send i'll i'll send them over um i just put the uh the link to the I've, I've uploaded it to our cinematologists youtube channel so i'll put the link on on here on the show notes as well so people can have a look at that but i'll send you personally the uh the pdf it were it'd be too big to share as a as a as a powerpoint file because it's just massive but the uh i'll, I'll, sh- I'll share the pdf Oh, well, mind you, I could probably um, I could probably do a lower version quite quickly on on WeTransfer, so you'll get the clips as well. Then, yeah. And to be honest with you, in, interestingly, the what we've just talked about there is kind of feeds into you know the theme of the episode, what we're going to talk about over the next hour or so. Which you know, this is one of those episodes where it's just going to be me and Neil talking about a few films. But I think we put, we wanted to put it particularly in a in a specific context that you you suggested so so maybe you could frame the episode for us neil in in terms of w- what you were thinking and what brought you to this idea about how you were feeling about watching films for the moment sure i think when i reached out to you i called it a viewing apathy or no no not viewing apathy because it's not there's no viewing apathy but i think it's it's like new release apathy i think it called in the sense that we're we're coming towards the end of the year and there's this imperative which is bubbling away to have seen as many new releases as possible before the end of the year in order to say, give an opinion or, of it all, or to feel like you've engaged with the year in sort of cinema. And I looked over sort of the, the streaming platforms that I had at the time, which I think was just Prime and Movie and BFI, for what was available that had come out this year. And I made a list of films that were just available, not to rent, but just, just available on there. And I was like... There's one film on this list that I want to see, like I was really interested to see, and that was The Eight Mountains, which was on BF- on the BFI player. Like the rest of them, I was like, if I didn't see any of these films, like I'd be fine with that. And then also, then I thought about the, and then I thought about the big releases, Barbie and Oppenheimer, which I still haven't seen, and but and one of them is only available to buy. Like Oppenheimer, you can buy it for a tenner on digital. I think Barbie you can now rent. But I was like, i I'd, I'd, I'll just wait, like. And that was quite telling for me because I think obviously last year, because I wasn't on the podcast at the end of the year, I was taking a break. And I also took a break from writing up where I normally write up for director's notes and, and other places. Like I just completely switched off any need in that last six months to stay present with what's coming out. So this year, I, I, I was like, why, why would I clamor to see all this stuff? Like literally who cares if I've seen Barbenheimer? And that was really interesting because, because alongside that, I was I've been watching a load of films and I've really wanted to watch a lot of stuff. But the stuff I've wanted to watch has not been the new releases. It's really not. So that was quite telling. So I think that's probably the first time where I've been engaged in film for a year, like I have this year, like a regular year. Watched a lot of stuff, but not wanted to feel like 
I've got a kind of good sense of what all those films are like. And I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that I'm not on social media. I think that's been a real big shift in terms of like, I have nowhere other than here to talk about this stuff. And here, I can kind of talk about anything I want. And I just wondered, yeah, if it was worth kind of exploring that with you, because I know that you kind of come in and out of an impetus to view stuff. Um, maybe it's my kind of more broadly in terms of all films, I don't know, but certainly, you know, you have spoken in the past about just like not feeling like you want to watch anything. So I thought it was interesting as we get towards the end of the year to almost have a kind of anti-year end chat. Although weirdly, weirdly, and this is one of those things, I have in the last week watched about five or six films on lists. Oh, sorry, like the art that did come out this year on different on different platforms. And I've rented a couple of stuff and I've been to the cinema and I've now got a load of films which I've really liked <laughs> <laughs> that came out this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of weird. Yeah, I felt very similar to that. It's almost as if, like two weeks ago, I said, this has been a really poor year in cinema. I like now, so actually, you know, I probably have got sort of five films that I could really, really rate and five, five, ten that I'd liked, but, you know, you're not going to put on a on the list. But I mean, I'm already getting list f- fatigue already because they're just everywhere. And it's kind of like that. It, yeah, it's that compulsion, that tyranny to define the year in whatever field you're in, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter if you're in games or in theater or in music or whatever, it's like define the year. And it's, and and it is social media, but it's that sense again of a continued sense of stating where you are, where are you, where are you on the chessboard of culture? Do you know what I mean? I like, I, I don't know how much of it again is tied into sort of the, that continual sort of uh, desire to define yourself politically, you know, and, and that, and, and the sort of, the popular culture element of that of that is is a sort of serendip- serendipitous kind of no not serendipitous what am I trying to say um oh God, what's the word that sounds like that but like an underhand sorry you have to cut that away you don't have to cut it out it's fine but like an underhand way is it surreptitious that's what I'm trying to say sorry God I'm, yeah that's what the 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 week's been like surreptitious way of positioning yourself politically but using popular culture it's like you know Barb I mean again I'm not saying that people don't like Barbie. I haven't seen it, so I can't say anything, but it's like, you know, but is putting Barbie at number one an aesthetic choice or an ideological choice, right? Again, we can argue about about that. But I guess I come in and out of it, like you were saying, often based on the, the how much stress I'm feeling at work and how much the fact that the work does feed into the feed into the cultural life at the same time. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously, you know, it's it's I find it really hard at times to watch films just to watch them. And I really have to sort of think to myself, okay, you know, just watch this. You don't have to, you don't have to teach it. You don't have to podcast it, right? Just watch it and see and see what happens. And I think if I go into viewing with that mindset, then it's a lot easier for me. Even when, like, say, for example, ordinarily, you know, if I had that mindset, I, it would be much easier for me to sit down and watch something, say, on movie that may be quite involved, quite art house. I mean, I watched B and I. We when we do get a bit of time now, we, and now these lists are out again. I'm slagging off lists and I was saying they're actually useful to say oh yeah I haven't seen that that looks good so we watched uh, Nostalgia you know the the sort of Italian crime film where where the, uh, there's a basically a guy goes back to his hometown he's been living actually in in um, in Africa in an Ab- North North African country married there speaks Arabic comes back um, and you f- you hear about why he had to leave and it's about his relationship with his uh, best friend who, t- who now is a gangster and his mother's nearing the end of her life Honestly, it was great. Really, really good. And it could have been, in fact, the sort of first half an hour, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be an absolute masterpiece. And then it didn't quite live up to that. But I never sort of, it it wasn't a sort of, um, oh yeah, yeah, this has been recommended to me. I've seen this on social media. And it wasn't a like, oh, Neil's seen this. Got to see it for the podcast. Got to have something to say about it. And, And it wasn't, it wasn't new. It was like, oh, this was whenever it was, you know, June or whatever. I was like, all of those things were out the window. We sat down and I was like, holy shit, that was a great film. So I think that sort of level of, I must get more into that that neutral zone of, I'm just watching this and it doesn't have anything to do with anything. And, and you know, you enjoy film, so watch a film. Yeah. It's such a, it's such an interesting thing to reflect on, I think, in terms of like, yeah, what we're watching and why. I remember the, I don't know who does this, but someone does a list at the end of the year they might listen I don't know they can tell us if it's them and there might be a few people do this but I always remember someone posted 
a list of best films they'd seen that year that weren't new. The best, like the best first watches, you know. And I always thought that was an interesting thing to do in terms of tracking a year and collecting the sort of cinema that you've been engaged with over the course of that year, but not from a kind of purely contemporary perspective. How your cinephilia changes, how a year at work or a year where you are in your life can really dictate the kinds of things that you're watching and the kinds of things you're drawn to. And I think that, yeah, the, 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 the contemporary list is a really, it's a very loud but not a very thoughtful um, collection of stuff. Yeah, you know, and, and and often I find that what changes is, you know, having followed a lot of the stuff through festivals, so listening to a lot of the Sundance and then Berlin and then Cannes and then Venice and everything, you know, there's a kind of commentary that emerges around films in a variety of different places. And what seems to be on the list at the end of the year is all the films that got talked about. There doesn't seem to be much real engagement with them as films at the end of it all in terms of looking back at how they fitted into a year of cinema. It's sort of like, well, this film was talked about a lot, but but why? And I think it's interesting that films that seem to be very polarizing, the three films that seem to be very polarizing this year at the top level in terms of Barbie, Oppenheimer and Killers of the Flower Moon are popping up on a lot of those lists, but I haven't read much that's really engaged with them as aesthetic artifacts. At, at, at this point in the year, looking back, and it's more about, oh, you know, that, that summer or Scorsese, this, you know, so I think that's really, that seems to be a shift, which I'm not, but again, I think what's different is like, it, I use the sight and sound list as a, as a, as a reminder of what had been out for myself in terms of what had been released. And then I was, I think one of the things I noticed, and that was like, I forgot the Saint Omer was this year when we did an episode and I was like, oh, of course, <laughs> you know, so it's useful as a kind of reminder because even going through my letterbox isn't always clear in terms of when when stuff was actually released. So I think they are useful in a personal sense if you can and disconnect from the chatter. But it's 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 really really hard because I think as well like you were saying about getting to this point of the year and being on fumes, it's almost like talking about this stuff at this point is going to be sort of counterintuitive to any kind of real thought about it emerging because. And when you look at the people who are writing about it, they've been at festivals all year <laughs> and they're going into kind of like end of year award season, critics choices. Where's the space, as you were saying in our academic life, but where's the critical space to say, okay, let's take a step back. Let's look at this in the round. Let's think about what, what we should be doing at this time of the year in terms of the kinds of films that we might be talking about. Um, you know, because for example, a film we're going to talk about today, Fremont, was it all over festival coverage at the start of the year? You know, like, wow, what a really great American indie, you know, like the kind they used to make. And then released here without any fanfare. And I haven't seen it anywhere in any of the British lists. So it's been released in this country. Where's the talk about this film? Like, what, what are critics doing if, if, they're not, if they're not also engaging with those films which have been released this year, which have gone under the radar and underrepresented? Maybe they'll think it's terrible. I would find that hard to believe, given... The festival response from the same critics earlier in the year yeah and it's funny because i had the same i had the same feeling with um all the beauty and the bloodshed which was january and that was like in my head that's all oh, that's I, and it wasn't on my list last year so again that's a film that i consider a last year film but i'm gonna think oh god is that on my should that be on what i talk about next next time when we when we do our roundup and yeah i mean it's it's funny again because we're you know we, we are gonna we are gonna do the same thing you know, when we talk about the end of, end of the year, but I'm kind of like slightly, may, may, maybe we could do it again a different way. I, can't, I kind of like that that time when we didn't list anything. We just sort of talked about cinematic highlights. I mean, maybe we could sort of, maybe we could go on the um, the website, UK re releases past, present and future and just sort of say, oh, January, that came out. Do you remember that? Oh, did you see that? You know, maybe a different way of, different way of doing it, you know what I mean? And they sort of list everything and almost sort of not even prepare you know what I mean? Oh, this is what, you know, so th there isn't that pressure anymore. It's kind of like just going through, going through the months and, and sort of scrolling down. So, oh yeah, that was then. I don't know. I mean, maybe that, that might be a little bit too riffy as it were. No, but I like the idea that if the lack of preparation should be, is, is a good thing to consider because either they're still with you as films and there's still moments in them or they're not. So let's, um let's talk about that. But I'm interested in that because I think that I'm not interested in listing the 10 films that I think are the most whatever 
But also, it's interesting you say where, when you were saying about you know the the Killers of the Flower Moon and and Barbenheimer. It's weird because you say that there there hasn't been a lot of critical evaluation with the with them as art, uh, aesthetic artifacts. You know, there's been reviews. You know, it's like I liked it or I didn't like it, and then there's where does it sit in the cultural conversation, which is the Twitter thing, right? But I'm almost thinking, what 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 do we add to that? It's like I want to be the place where people can go and they don't get Barbenheimer, they get something else. And I like I think oh, and sometimes what's funny as well, I've, I've I've read a few lists that are you know the Sight and Sound and the Guardian list are probably the two big ones in the UK that sort of count down. And you know I think they're good. It like you say to be able to sort of look back and think, oh yeah, I haven't seen that, and people have recommended that. That looks good. But then also I looked at Amy Tobin's list and like like seven of those films I've never even heard of. So I like that idea of people come up with with stuff that turns you on to stuff that there's been no conversation what, whatsoever. And I'm really I try not to be one of those people who be kind of like, oh well, that's all right. It's all right saying those films that nobody's ever heard of, and probably maybe not. You're not even able to watch over here. But at least it's at least it's giving you an alternative history, I suppose. You know, of the year in that in in that sense. So yeah, but, but I mean, just just very quickly, sort of turning back to your your sense of of whether whether you're in a particularly motivated place to to watch films i mean what's interesting for me this year is i've i've watched an awful lot more sport than i uh have in previous years particularly football i've watched quite a bit of football this year which and i and in the last sort of five years i've really not engaged with it at all i always watch tennis as you know as everybody knows but i've been uh it's almost kind of like it it's a a mindset for me of get over yourself you know what i mean if if, if the, the and i read this book called you know your four thousand weeks on earth and it's like you know you you yeah it, it, it's a lot shorter than you realize it is your life i'm gonna it's just very existential all of a sudden now but it's like you you, you miss out on you know 99.999999 to infinity percent of the world you miss out on so you can't beat yourself up about missing out on stuff <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, and then, and then on, you know, to go along with that, if you want to spend an hour, 90 minutes sat in front of a random football game, then do it. Especially if it's going to chill you, chill you the fuck out when you're getting loads of shit at work. You know what I mean? It's, you can't sort of beat yourself up too much about the fact that what you think in your mind you should be doing, you know, I need to keep teaching myself that. And the more I think, think that the easier it is to deal with, you know, the fact that I am always thinking you know, I should be working, should be doing this, should be doing that. Why Why are you watching football? You're supposed to be an intellectual, you know, this kind of shit. So it, it, it's interesting how that that has been a, another avenue, which maybe means I'm not, I'm not watching or I'm not caring about watching every single movie and having an opinion on every single movie. Yeah, life is too short. Um, and I think one of the things that's been so rewarding about the podcast is that sense of, yeah, being able to think about the audi- our audience and think, well, yeah, you know, I don't think that they do care if what our opinion is. I mean, then you know, if we if we shared our opinion on that stuff, then it would. But I don't think that's why they're here, you know. Um, and also, I don't think that our ability to engage with the stuff that we want to engage with would be. Oh, and arguably, in my case, has not been enhanced in the past by trying to have an opinion and stay abreast of everything. I think that I feel more confident in how I'm communicating my feelings about films now that I have been able to have a much healthier relationship with a lot of that stuff. And from the feedback that I've got from people who have engaged, that seems to be something that is felt as well, which is nice, you know. And I think that it's not a contrarian thing. It's not like, because I also want to be the space that doesn't talk about that stuff as a kind of, you know, sort of default, but not in a kind of like, I'm not anti it, you know, I'm sure I'll see the films at some point and I'm sure I'll enjoy them or aspects of them and have thoughts on them, you know, but I, I, it is more just, yeah, like, what are we going to do with the time and the space that we've got? Let's, I'd rather talk like this than be like, oh, hey, here's my notes on Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in on like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, um, no, for sure, for sure. This really sparked off, didn't it? In terms of because we were thinking about what we're gonna what we're gonna watch. Can we get to the cinema? 
And can you get to the cinema and what can you get to see? Because obviously you've got a slightly different situation sort of being where you are in Falmouth. And this was over Napoleon, basically. And it, it, it's interesting because I did want to see that film. And I'm very kind of... I'm kind of Ridley Scott, I think, has made some wonderful films and he's made some turkeys and he's got a very interesting position in film. And what I thought about this was, and I agreed with you, I said, let's, let's watch that because we, we can both see it at the cinema rather than rely on something we can stream because we wanted to do that. But then I came back and sort of said, my opinion of it was, I didn't think it was that good and there isn't really an awful lot to talk about. So then we were like, okay, so we're back to square one now. So and then you were like, oh, yeah, I sent you a list of stuff to watch. And then you were like, I don't fancy any of this. So I was like, so we were both like, okay, so we're going to do. And then it came out of that. But it but it was interesting, isn't it? How I said to you, I think at that point, I don't know what, I'm in, I'm in this zone where, where right now where I don't like anything. I don't, yeah, I haven't seemed to have liked anything in the last sort of three or four weeks that I've watched. And it's not as if I hated Napoleon. I just, I kind of already knew what it was and it was what I thought it was going to be. I mean, it was big, spectacular. The world building element of it, I thought was great. I thought it was ridiculous in terms of the acting. It was cartoonish. Obviously, there's supposed to be a director's cut that's like four and a half hours long where it, where it makes more sense. Yeah, and I agree the action, action sequences are great, but like when you're spending that much money on a film, shouldn't the action sequences be great? Shouldn't it, be, shouldn't it all be up on the screen and you should see where the money is being spent? Um, but it, to, to give you a sort of analogy... Do you remember those remember those annuals you got when you were a kid? Like say say you were into dinosaurs or say you're into space or whatever, and you could get an annual where there was a bit of text and there was huge pictures, you know, for a sort of 13, 14 year old boy, and you were like that with the big pictures of of whatever. That's the kind of movie that this is. It's like a big annual with big pictures and a little bit of text here and there. <laughs> that's what it reminded me of. Uh see, that's why that's why people come. For this kind of analysis, that kind of analysis is why you're here, aren't you, listeners? But you know what I'm I saying, it's, though. It's it, it's it, you know. I think you're spot on. I think what was yeah, it, it was worrying in the sense we were trying to trying to trying to put together an episode in a weird time, and it was a weird time for us in terms of like not wanting to necessarily watch a lot of stuff. And I didn't want to go and see Napoleon, like, but cinema. The cinema trips for me now have become a bit more of a social outing. So I've got a couple of friends who like to go to the cinema. So they said, do you want to go and see Napoleon? And I hadn't seen him for a while. So I was like, okay. And I'm trying to be, as readers of the the news that will know, I'm trying to be more social. I'm trying to cultivate friendships. I'm trying to not be a hermit and kind of reject other people. Um, you know, so it's like, okay. So Napoleon was a good, because I figured that they wouldn't be into the new Karis Mackey, which turned to be true. Although I did see that on my own. It was, it was, it was great. But so it's like, okay, we'll go and see Napoleon. And I was like, okay, we'll talk about that. And then I wasn't excited to see it, but it was like, okay, well, you know, and I think that there was a sense of, well, it's been a while since we did an episode. I'd like to talk about stuff. I don't really know what else to do. We haven't got anything lined up. So what can we kind of put together? And that was that. And then it was like, oh yeah, Dario didn't think it's great. And I'm not huge. I mean, I'm not a Ridley Scott fan in any real sense. And I was like, it was what I hoped it would be because I think so much of the stuff I watch of his is bad. You know, so the fact that it was a giant, ridiculous, ludicrous bit of noise was kind of just what I was hoping for, and that it wasn't it wasn't one of the other things. So, but what was also interesting was that again, because of the way we're putting it together, the one film that you mentioned that was on the list you sent through, and I it was weird because I sent a message to you saying all those films were the ones that I made a list of that I didn't want to see, <laughs> which was I just thought was hilarious. You basically sent me a list that I'd sort of cross through. Apart from a fire, which uh, I did want to see. Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about that. Just to say that on that list, the one I would recommend is Return to Soul. I think you'll like that. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend that rather than the other ones I haven't seen. So, uh, um, but that is worth seeing. But a fire, yeah, really interesting. Um, Petzold, Christian Petzold is a, a, a director who I know. I've got friends. I mean, Savina is a massive, massive fan of Christian Petzold. I've liked his his stuff. Some of the fabulous elements of it in recent films I haven't liked as much. I really liked his earlier stuff, sort of Barbara, the one with the, his stuff with Nina Hoss. I really like, and but he's a very you know he's got that sort of European post Hanukkah type of style. I think in in many ways, and I think he's. 
he's interested in character psychology, but he, he sets up very specific situations, it seems to me, for his characters to be explored. And and often that gets that that gets revealed in specific moments within the film. So he's like situational of the film as a whole. And then there are little moments within a film where how the characters interact tell you something about them, but then also sort of make you reflect on, okay, what is it like to be human? How do we react like that? I mean, and when we talk about the film, I'll explain more what I mean. But as you said, there are many people who haven't liked this this film in his oeuvre. And I, I didn't like it at the beginning, but it was obvious why you wouldn't like it because it's a pretty unsympathetic central character. And also an unsympathetic male wannabe writer, intellectual type character who's insufferably into his own sense of himself and his own art. So, you know, the reason I don't like it is because there is a sort of psychological, is that me kind of thing going on. Although I think there are, there's elements to his own sense of himself that I think are more complex than just, he, he's just up his own ass about, about himself, which I think get revealed more and more. But the, the, the central um, female character who his his who's kind of pet's old second uh muse if you can if you can still allow to use that word uh played by paula beer who interestingly looks very much like nina hoss it's almost as if he's substituted one for the other you know uh, her character is incredibly interesting i think and actually my conversations with because i watched it with b my girlfriend and she actually gave the the reading of the film which i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna sort of talk about in a minute which was just really interesting because she saw the film from the female character's point of view, which is, was just fascinating to listen to. But yeah, what did you make of it? Yeah, I really liked it. And I think similarly to what you were kind of starting to allude to, there, I really liked it because of how uncomfortable it made me in terms of a kind of examination of a kind of self-involved white man. You know, I thought I thought it was a really smart film that, yeah, very kind of overtly presented an unlikable protagonist and then over the course of the film kind of chipped away in a way that I think Inside Lewin Davis does at, is it simply that this person is an arsehole or is there something else at play and what's at play? And I just thought it was really kind of moving how it was about the way that you can be involved in the self and your insecurity and your vulnerability and your lack of confidence and lack of belief in yourself can manifest as just being a dick. And I thought that the performance, the guy's performance was really interesting in terms of in his body language and his kind of physicality was like, I don't believe what I'm saying, but I, I, I've kind of created this shield for myself, which is defensive and combative and it masks so much. And then what's really fascinating about the film, I think, which is why I liked it so much, was that her character gets it, but doesn't always engage with it. She sees him for what he is and sees what's underneath, but isn't a kind of manic pixie dream girl kind of character, but observes him a lot, engages with him in certain ways, has this great line where he's like, I didn't know this about you. And she was like, you, you didn't ask. Like, you know... Um, she shares a lot of his characteristics that she kind of reveals throughout and sort of acts as, yeah, a bellwether for whether he's just being a dick or whether he's actually just replicating this kind of classic trope that we men often do. Yeah, I just I just thought it was a really fan, fascinating, fascinating portrait in that sense. So I'll get to her character in a second. But I just want to throw something in there in terms of the the uh, Thomas. Is, uh, sorry, uh, Thomas Schubert is the actor. Leon is the is the character. So yeah, just just to sort of interrogate your reading there of of the the Leon character as so the main character. I didn't really feel like his an, uh, annoying traits, his his sort of self centeredness, and again, it's like pushing back. I think a, a little bit on your reading is that actually I think he thought he was great. And what he was annoyed about was that people were not like, well, yeah, my book is, your book is a masterpiece. Do you know what I mean? You're amazing. And he couldn't understand why people were more interested in the other, the other characters in the, in the film. So his best friend, who was an art guy, uh, was trying to put his portfolio together. And then this 
this lifeguard turns up who he kind of ridicules for being a lifeguard and then actually tells this really interesting story which shows he's got you know he had a storytelling talent in, in him and then the publisher turns up and it was like you know let's sit, sit down and read your book but i actually ends up being more interested in all three of the other other characters he can't believe he can't fathom why he's not the center of attention so i don't think it's vulnerability and and like lack of self-confidence or imposter syndrome i think he thinks why the fuck are these people not putting me at the center of the universe you know yeah i don't see it that way at all um i think that just because he does it doesn't mean that's what he really believes you know i think that i think that he puts down his friend because he's worried i think he knows that he's i think he knows he's written a bad book he's trying to justify himself constantly by putting other people down and i think when she comes in and he he's very dismissive of her role and stuff but i think a lot of it is he knows deep down but i think much of so much of it is in what his body's doing that his voice is not he's saying all this stuff but physically in his face particularly he's like uh, this is my defense and i know because i think and when when he gives her the book and he's so and it's weird i think because what i kept thinking of is that remember when i was t- talking to your students about feedback and you said to me like how do you take feedback and i said to you that i used to take feedback as a personal attack kind of thing you know and be like what do you know but that response always comes from a place of i know it's not good enough and that I, maybe I was carrying a lot of that into the film, which I can I, I will claim bias in terms of sort of how I was feeling at the time. But I certainly felt that there was enough in his. And I, I think at the beginning of the film, it's absolutely right. It sets him up as this kind of dismissive know-it-all. You know, I'm better than everyone. What can you possibly know? And then I, it, it chips away at that and reveals that I think it is a, just a lack of confidence in certainly in the book that he's written and a sense that this thing that he's done is not is not very good and he knows it you know and 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 also i think because it's it it was captured in the end again in his physical in his physical performance in terms of he and i won't give away too much because i think people might want to see it but the film story gives him the book that he needs to write in terms of what happens and yeah and it it it, it seeks (laughs) seeks as a blast from the past it segues into the you know in terms of the film we're watching into the book that he's writing in a really beautiful way and his his ownership of the story that he's telling in the book at the end of the film feels radically different to the character we meet at the start in terms of his understanding of where that story comes from and that it's not his to tell or it's not his to own that it's just his to tell and i thought that was really beautifully handled in terms of the journey that character and I think that because I think I am interested in these kinds of stories, I, I really like Inside Lewin Davis for this very reason. Like, it's not just a film about an arsehole with a load of talent who squanders it. Like, that film is about grief, ultimately, um, and someone who's not not able to process grief to to make most of opportunities that come his way. And this feels like a... And I just think it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because almost a kind of bold move to be like, in this age of representation, he presents this film about yeah kind of unlikable privileged white guy and sets up a lot of sets up a lot of challenges in terms of seeing if there's anything else under there and i completely see that people would say nah there's nothing else under there but i think from a from a personal point of view i found a lot in it that was and i just thought the filmmaking was lovely as well it reminded me a lot of roma's the collectioners um i think it's very indebted to that in terms of a setup particularly but uh vibes as well so what was b reading on it what was b's reading on it well, well, basically, B said that in some ways she read that character as very much a cohort of women that she understands and knows because she places herself in that to a certain degree, I think. But a, a kind of Eastern European, very intelligent, talented, good-looking woman who doesn't shout about or indulge in any kind of aspiration to develop herself in that direction beyond the fact that she does it right so not like the men who i'm a writer you know what i mean I, i'm you know this literary genius it's like she doesn't even mention the fact that she's doing this phd on poetry and there's this moment where she gives this you know uh monologue or is it a solilo- soliloquy when you're doing a poetry reading without from memory 
and and like basically the 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 publisher guy sort of falls in love with her in scare quotes kind of thing and it's a really enigmatic ending because you get the you do get that feeling that she is embodying this this role of not being empathetic to but 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 sort of complicit in the narcissism of the male characters around her at the expense of her own talents and intelligence do you know what i mean it's kind of like it's almost to me it's like a feminist seminar but not in a didactic kind of way in that sense it's like you know here is this character who we never really find out about until there's moments where she's given a little bit of room to breathe in that dinner scene and then even at the very end you know i'm not going to give the ending away but her it seems like her wanting to to aid the male characters is kind of transferred from one to another and it's like she still is not her own fully realized autonomous person and b was saying that she knows you know because of culture she knows so many women who are really super talented and super intelligent and ended up just marrying some guy because that's what society tells them to do to be secondary to the male ego in that in that sense so and i, and I think that that was really interesting because it a real sort of a real eye opener in ter- not just in terms of the reading of the film but the way that you see a film if you're coming from a different a different you know gender perspective racial perspective whatever about what characters what they embody or symbolize to you that's really interesting yeah and I, I think that's that's a fascinating insight i think in terms of like what what the character's doing throughout you know that that feels like yeah it, 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 she never feels passive but she also doesn't feel like she's kind of enacting any kind of arc. There's a kind of an ambivalence within the character, which I think is is kind of inscrutable a lot of the time, but always, you know, just really sort of eminently watchable in the sense that, yeah, she's kind of in service to the male characters, but not in that kind of very narrow, traditional way. There feels like there's something contextual below the surface. In just the matter of factness of 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 of, of how we under, how we how we learn about the character in terms of what she's doing in the summer and she's not that willing to go into the she's existing in the moment she's very present that's really interesting that reading yeah so thanks to thanks for sharing that but she doesn't pull she doesn't put herself no. at all any of her you know attributes to the foreground whatsoever and the film doesn't give the, the film doesn't have any like you say arc or direction for her beyond the fact that we see, you know, oh, this is a kind of psychological trait that seems to be part of her character that she just doesn't, she somehow doesn't seem to see herself. And I wonder how much, I'd really like to think that Petzold kind of knows this and is is sort of showing that rather than just using that that characterization just to say something about the about the narcissistic guy because I think he I think if I'm reading the ending right he probably does I think so know? yeah and she definitely seems like she's interested in the people that she meets as people you know she's not interested in him as a writer she's interested in him as a person she's already interested in him before she reads the book and it's great that she just kind of carries on it doesn't it doesn't change her opinion of him at all even though it changes his opinion of himself and and at least in the short term cool so um um, the, so the other film that we decided that we were going to talk about was this film Fremont, which I, to be honest with you, I didn't, I'd, I'd heard the name. I didn't know anything about it. I could tell that this would be right up your street. It was every single review I've read was like Jarmusch-esque. It really is, you know, the sort of the deadpan acting, the characters sort of delivering these philosophical declarations and the repeated scenarios, particularly the sort of weird therapist where she's it's like, what is this guy doing? You know, it's just, just ridiculous. But what I, what I really liked about it, it's it tells a, a an immigrant tale that we don't we don't often see, or it's it's sort of done in a way that is slightly different. I think, which is it it's not often it's not often that that it's articulated that there is there is just literally no say in where in in the outcome of an immigrant moving from one place to another in terms of what they wanted for themselves, like there was no choice. It's like people ask, "Oh, you must be you must be really happy that you're in America now because you're you know you're from Afghanistan." It's like I don't I don't really know. I didn't know what America would be like. I don't really know if I like it or not. You know what I mean? It's like and and that's what I really liked about it. It sort of reverses that Western 
expectations of what a, an immigrant experience might be, a, but it's not overtly sort of political about it. Yeah, kind of small p political. Yeah, the, 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 she says, doesn't she? At the, at the when she's asked about it, she, well, it could have been Germany, it could have been England, you know, it could have been South America, Ecuador. I think she says, I just wanted to get out. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a film. As soon as I heard about it in reviews, I was like, okay, that's on the watch list for the Jarmusch. And I think what's interesting is because I think that people sort of say a lot of stuff is Jarmuschian, so I'm always interested to see it, but I'm always kind of skeptical in terms of. Is the film actually inspired by that kind of filmmaking, or is it just a has it, is it lazy criticism to say that something that's a bit quirky uses some funky music, black and white? Is it is it just is it is it a label that's sort of thrown at it, but isn't actually kind of relevant? This is one of the few times I think where I really felt like the filmmaker had an affinity to the the cinema of Jarmusch and was interested in using what he did particularly in the kind of the early works i think to kind of to, to tell this story and it's a, it's a reminder of you know the kind of the alienation that's in those early jarmusch films in terms of these characters who are on the fringes and classic story of people on the fringes of american life including this psychiatrist who's kind of doing all this pro bono work is clearly not the kind of psychiatrist we're not we're used to seeing in american cinema or tv you know he's yeah, he's a strange person, um, and his methods are. Interesting. He just likes to read from. Um, what's the Jack London novel that he reads from? Um, the White Fang. White Fang. He's obsessed with White Fang. He's obsessed with White Fang. All the lessons of life are from White yeah. Fang. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> but it's not. It's not quirky for the sake of quirky. There's a real richness to the characters, and the characters, the actors, all the actors, are invested in terms of making these kind of people human but really kind of it's very funny and yeah really endearing you know there's a real gentleness to the the flow of the story which is not to say that it's not yeah politically informed by experience and really rich but it's never exploitative and it's never quirk i just found it really well crafted as a yeah as an outsider tale really and it, it just yeah like kind of understanding what Jarmusch was doing in the 80s and saying what's the place for that kind of storytelling in American indie cinema now and it makes sense that that would be the kind of story that would fit that and just as a pleasurable experience you know great performances great faces yeah she's very good and and, and Anaita Wali Zada as Donya the lead character she's very very uh, convincing but both being able to sort of pull off the Jarmuschian deadpan but then also give the arch looks when somebody does something or says something odd she's I'm doing it now as podcast gold to the camera, which is sort of raising an eyebrow or sort of smiling knowingly that this guy's talking bullshit or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. She's She's got a real sense of... It, it, she kind of holds her interior life really, really well, which is both kind of telling in terms of the experiences she, she has when she's talking about being a translator. She does not give too much away in terms of what really must be behind the surface. And the psychiatrist is very astute in understanding that there's way more that is being held back. But she's also very secure in terms of the life that she wants and that she feels she's capable of with all of that in mind. And I think that, she, yeah, her performance is great. And then just the way it shifts in the last sort of 20 minutes, really, to this kind of where she meets this mechanic played by Jeremy Allen White, who's just fantastic. I mean, he's just, he's just he just brings such. Well, he's the American actor du jour right now, isn't he? He you know is, I mean? yeah. And. He gives such a great performance in 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 a, in a capsule, um, which just makes it such a lovely, lovely sort of final twenty minutes. It's it's absolutely yes. It's interesting that way I thought about that. I mean, it, the, the director is is Iranian, Babak Jalali, uh, but th this is a, a Afghan Im immigrant, so it's kind of you know that there is that differentiation there. But I thought the last twenty minutes were really interesting to me because yeah, like you say, he plays this mechanic who he's almost the sort of symbol of redemptive blue collar America in some ways do you know what I mean it's like she's not really in love with her situation and you know an outsider in America is not the place to be but then she meet she meets him it's it's kind of it's all to me it's almost kind of like saying ah this is the sort of the the, the salt and earth of America that I could kind of fall in love with sort of thing do you know what I mean and maybe that's a little bit you know idealistic but 
I think it's in keeping with the with, with the film in that in that. Sense. Oh yeah, I mean, it, there's a heavily romanticized element to it. But I think what was interesting about it was that so much of what the political discourse in America in the last few years has been is that there's a kind of there's an overt tension between white blue collar America and you know non white America, particularly sort of black and Latinx and sort of you know East Asia, you know Asian and sort of other immigrants. But but the, but the, but their affinity when you actually look at it in terms of their status as outsiders and marginalized within American culture, they've actually got much more in common. And I thought it was really interesting, almost a kind of way of saying that, bringing it back at the end to be like, well, we're not saying that all the outsiders in America are immigrants. It's a nice way of reminding, actually, this guy is in a town in the middle of nowhere, completely outside of urban, liberal, or even kind of large political economic the expectation is that he's going to be antagonistic or whatever. And it's almost a kind of like, it is romanticized, but I think it was also, it was just nice to be like, actually, these people have a lot more in common. And often it takes someone outside to remind of that. And to, you know, to have a kind of story from an immigrant about an immigrant that acknowledges that at this time was just really kind of fascinating. But but also I think I think arguably idealistic in terms of what's happening on the ground. But again, the casting helped make it just feel such a natural. Oh, it works. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm not saying it doesn't work at all. But it's just, you know, you sort of read these things in the round a little bit, and and you know, I mean, it's one of those. It's a movie. Just the way that it it falls into place is very, you know, it, it it's dramatically. What's the word? Convenient for that to happen. But but that's fine. That's totally fine. You know, you you enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, great. I mean, do you want a, a quick word on Leave the World Behind? Sure, go for it. Yeah, because I you you sprung this on me last night. Yeah, I was just like I I I was kind of like it was again. It's just end of a long day, and you're like, what what am I going to watch? I can't be bothered to scroll. I saw that a couple of people had said this is good. You know what I mean? And and what's funny is it reminded me a little bit of Don't Look Up in the in the fact it's a Netflix release, massive cast. So Julia Roberts, Mahershala Ali. Ethan Hawke and quite brilliantly Kevin Bacon turns up as a as a sort of grizzled blue collar American kind of survivalist, which he's just great at. Yeah, um, Roberts and Ethan Hawke's character take their their kids out to uh, a, a sort of Airbnb type nice very house there. I think that it's New York, isn't it? That that, that they're in. Am I, am I right about that? Or yeah, um, Long Island. That's it. Yeah. So they t- they, they, the the beginning of the of the film is basically Julia Roberts sort of saying. I hate people. Let's get out of here. You know what I mean? She plays a very, she is what in Twitter parlance right now would be called a Karen, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. And Ethan Hawke is, the, so she's in advertising. Ethan Hawke's a professor, right? So he's got this very laid back, laconic, let's not confront, let's let's work everything out kind of character. Um, but they end up at this, this Airbnb. And then halfway through the night, the first night that they're there, Mahershala Ali, turns up at the door dressed in his tuxedo and with his daughter and kind of says, this is our house. Can we come in? We've had a, a problem in the city. And, and, and what, what eventually, I don't want to give it away because it's, it's quite a long movie, but the entertainment of the movie is you genuinely do not know what is happening and what's going to happen, which is where the real interest lies in terms of, again, the aesthetic element of it. Although having said that, it's really interestingly shot. I mean, the, the, the director is very much getting the camera to do things <laughs> you know what i mean and and there's some some great use of special effects i think as well um some great sort of flashbacks or hallucination scenes at the same time and and also just sort of layered in again pr- perhaps not as overtly as something like don't look up but you know there is the sort of racial element that is layered in there and also that sense of blue collar versus white collar america you know the liberals yeah they may be in, in, intellectuals but they're not prepared if the if the shit hits the fan kind of thing. And all of that is playing out with the great cast that every scene, it doesn't matter which scene you're in because the characters kind of get split up in different locations. You want to watch them all because they're all great actors and great movie stars, you know, going through this. So it's just a really, really solid piece of mainstream dystopian entertainment. And I really liked it. Yeah, it was weird because I'd heard about it 
I think on the Little Gold Men podcast, they'd sort of, you know, announce, you know, to sort of, they'd sort of do some new release roundup and they'd sort of said about it. And there was a kind of consensus there, actually, yeah, this, you know, and a lot of people were saying the same thing, like into award season, watching new releases, thinking, oh, you know, if they haven't been at festivals, what are they like? Usually just kind of filler, but kind of everyone was like, actually, this is a good movie, you know? And I think a lot of it does come down to what you were saying in terms of the cast. I don't really know the filmmaker's work. He's done a lot of telly and he's worked with Julia Roberts a lot in telly. So I thought, was, I thought she was great. Um, again, just playing yeah. against playing against type. Yeah, unglamorous. Unglamorous, pretty, yeah, kind of like you're just like... Pretty na- gnarly character. Yeah, she's a na- gnarly is a good word for it. And, and Ethan Hall's character just reveals himself to be more and more of a wimp, which again, you just don't see him do that. And that was just, it was clear that they were having, they were having a lot of fun, but not at the expense of undermining, trying to sell the story. You know, just, I think just the performances felt like they were, they were kind of stretching themselves in places they hadn't necessarily done. Mahershala Ali always, always great. And it's the re, it, I think it's the first reunion of Kevin Bacon and Julia Roberts since Flatliners. So it's cause for celebration, if nothing else, uh, for that. But yeah, I think apart from the music, which I just thought was, a bit annoying um, in terms of how the cues were deployed. I thought the filmmaking was really, yeah, really, really solid, um, and yeah, visually very interesting. Um, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was really fun. Yeah, great, great wreck, and glad to have, glad to have seen it. Fantastic. Okay, should we leave it there? We've had a good solid hour. Good solid hour. I think that's a good place to end. Some nice chat. Yeah, we're getting tighter with our podcasting, Neil. We'll be professionals one day. You never know. You never know. <laughs> yeah. Stranger things have happened. Well, thanks very much for, for listening, guys. I'm sorry I hadn't been a, a new episode. And, you know, we've, well, there has been. Neil's episode was new, but um, a new one with both of us on for a few weeks. But we have our end of season finale coming up next. So we're probably going to, we're going to probably going to take that next week and then release it maybe the 27th. Is that, is that the plan, Neil? Yeah, I think so. We'll record it before Christmas and you're away. So uh, that'll be released sort of in that window between Christmas and New Year. Everyone's sat on a sofa having eaten too much, you know, trying to scramble around for some kind of cultural nourishment. And then we'll just land just at the right time. At the right time. Yeah, absolutely. So looking forward to that. And yeah, we'll come up. I I don't know. I mean, we'll we'll figure something out, won't we, obviously. But um, I don't know whether sort of doing our top fives again. I don't know. We'll, we'll, We'll see. We'll see what it is. But. Yeah, great to great great to talk to you again as usual. Thanks very much to uh, to everyone for your continued support. Um, anybody who you know wants to drop us a, a few quid just to help again with the with the costs of keeping the Titanic that is the cinematologist going, we'd really appreciate that. Neil's uh, last newsletter is definitely very much worth a read, and and I think there's been we've had some good feedback on all the newsletters this uh, season. So, you know, if you want to indulge in for a couple of quid a month to get some of our bonus content and uh, yeah, well, I might I might do so, I might do some voice notes or one maybe one voice note from France um, for the bonus as well. But yeah, Neil, I'll see you very soon. We'll do. Thanks, everyone. So this has been the Cinematologist podcast. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.